Everybody, welcome back to Leosophy. Um, uh, this time I'm going to start talking more about uh, agrarianism and what I call primitism, which is, uh, I'd like to think of a better name for it, especially now that I know that uh, some people who advocate for apes to be regarded as citizens and have full rights as human beings is also called primitive primitism. Um, but uh, let me start by going over some numbers with you guys. This is how I wanted to begin this. <coughs> Let's start with how the U.S. Army is organized, okay? A squad is four to ten soldiers. Think about shows you watch. How many characters are there on average? Not including, you know, tertiary or side characters who sometimes introduced. How many are there? There's usually three to eight characters. Eight's really pushing it, by the way. Okay. A platoon is 16 to 40 soldiers. Now think about an ideal classroom. Like, you know, when things, when you're actually able to learn one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of times kids will have uh, secondary classes. If they're doing poorly, they will be in numbers on par with that. If they go to a big school where there's like a thousand or more in a class. A company is 100 to 200 soldiers. <coughs> That's where I'm going to stop for now, because now I'm going to start talking about what is sometimes referred to as the monkey sphere, which is what I first started calling it a long time ago, back when I read an article about it. Now, uh, it's not a very professional term. There's a better term for it. It's called Dunbar's number, and there are plenty of flaws with Dunbar's number in that not a lot of uh, research really validates it. But it, it struck me as interesting when I first started reading about this number because all my anecdotal evidence really lended a lot of support for it. It was something that fascinated me. And okay, here's what Dunbar's number is. This is what uh, has been jokingly and half seriously by some been referred to as the monkey sphere. Think about everyone you interact with on a daily basis. Now think about everyone you know and think about regularly, like on a personal level. Now think about people who play a role in your life that you don't really know who they are or what they do. And I'll flesh this out here in a minute. If you really think about it, if you sit down and start writing it out, chances are the people that you think about, like as people, like in a three-dimensional way, personal kind of way, the kind of people that you would send a Christmas card to. It's probably 100 to 150 people. Now, that's not everyone you interact with. Quick, what's the name of your garbage man? You probably don't know, do you? I mean, and if you do, you don't know him as your garbage man. You know him previously, and then you just found out later, oh, yeah, Frank does the garbage runs through my neighborhood. You don't know that person. Now think back to when you were a kid. And you saw, like, your teacher at a restaurant, or uh, you saw a, a co-worker of one of your parents out and about just doing regular things. Wasn't that a surreal moment for you? Didn't that seem strange? It was like, why are they doing this? I actually had a conversation the other day. I, I, somebody that I, I frequently see at a place that I, I uh, buy things from, like a cashier, in other words, um, I ran into them out in public, and they even remarked how surreal that always is. When you see somebody that you expect to see at a workplace, and you see them not at a workplace, it's weird. It's like, why are you there? You're supposed to be, like, they're just supposed to put you in a broom closet when you're done, <laughs> when you clock out. And I know that's not a logical conclusion, but that's how people feel. And the logic behind this comes from Dunbar's number, which is, you can only truly empathize with about 100 to 150 people. When I say empathize, I mean in a direct kind of way. Like, I know Tom Cruise is a real guy. I know he's a person. I know he has hopes and dreams and feelings. I know he has nightmares and, and wakes up in a cold sweat sometimes. And I don't want anything bad to happen to him. But if tomorrow I were to turn on the news and they said, you know, Tom Cruise was savaged by a bear... It wouldn't break my heart or anything. I would, I would be like, ah, that sucks for Tom Cruise. And that's somebody that I see regularly, but it's not in real life. 
just not everyday waking life. On the flip side, if I were to open a newspaper and it were to say, uh, bus crash local, bus crash kills three, I would be more sad, even though I don't necessarily know those people. And then on the flip side, if, if I hear that, you know, some acquaintance of mine, someone that I know, know, even if I haven't spent a great deal of time with them lately, that feels very real. And that's because empathy is more like a spectrum. It works in grades. There are people who we regard as real cognitively, logically, the same way I, I regard a million dollars as a million dollars. But I can't think about a million dollars. Like, I can't visually conjure up, and neither can you. If you think you can, you're deluding yourself. You cannot think about a million dollars as an object. You can think about three dollars as an object, the same way you would think about three pairs or three uh, dogs or, you know, 17 chicken wings. You can think about that. You can mentally picture that. You can't mentally picture a million dollars. And you can't mentally picture a million people. It's like, uh, I think it was Stalin who said something like, a hundred people die, it's a tragedy, a million people die, it's a statistic. I, I know I'm misquoting, but that's how we think. We can't, when it comes to everyday objects, we can't think about big numbers. We'll now apply that to personal relationships, apply that to empathy, apply that to uh, compassion, to humanity. You can't really think about large groups of people the same way you would about your family and your friends and your community. And this is called Dunbar's Number. The idea that you can only truly view about 100 to 150 people as real people, like really care about them. I remember uh, recently I was, I was at an establishment and there was a guy outside and he was trying to start his car and he couldn't and I went to check on him and when I went back inside the establishment the people who I was with were weirded out that I went to check on him. They were like, you, you know that guy? And they kept asking me about it and this isn't me virtue signaling. It's, I'm actually kind of baffled by that. They did not care at all about this person. They weren't the least, in fact they were weirded out that I was concerned about this person because I didn't know them. And that's the norm for people. And this isn't me saying, oh, well, I'm different, I'm special. No, no. I, I, I don't really know what motivated me to behave that way. Um, there's a lot of confusion with stuff like that. But where I'm going with this is if you look at crime rates and you look at human happiness and you look at the overall dynamics of the way a society is run, it's run in groups that are much smaller than what any town is normally going to be. Much smaller. So it, people are inherently tribal in that way. And I can think of no greater example of this. Is It always blows my mind because I grew up in a very rural environment and I had like 30 people in my old classes. But uh, when I talk to people in, in bigger cities and they're like, oh yeah, in my, uh, my classroom was, you know, we had 1,050 people somewhere. Like, Holy crap, really? And, and you you see this like if I, when I was in school, if one of the kids got sick and died or something, it would have been mind altering, life changing. It would have been a tragedy. People would have would have been messed up psychologically for months. But I've talked to people who you know yeah in my class you know we had like a thousand people and one of the kids had leukemia. I didn't really know him. It wasn't really a big deal. It's like wow, it, it's a staggering thing to see. And and uh, next week I'm gonna tie this in with agrarianism, but, but right now this episode is about how people function best when they're around people who see them as real, who empathize with them, who, who can actually be concerned about bad things happening to them. And you see this with the way a society runs too. If you look at um, communities that function almost autonomously, it's one of the reasons why Japan, in addition to homogeneity, which I will not get into for this episode, that's for a much later time, um, that one of the reasons why they have such a low crime and, and society functions so well is because there's a sense of shame if you do something that, that draws the ire of the people nearest to you. But that's because 
even in the bigger cities, they function as these little tiny groups, these little splinter groups. So you don't litter because you don't want to offend your neighbor. You don't want to make your neighbor's yard dirtier. You don't vandalize property because it's your neighbor's property. That kind of empathy, that kind of social cohesion, it tends to work best whenever people are in small enough groups to where you actually think about the person you're doing that to as a person, rather than just an abstraction. It's not, oh, that's Mr. Johnson's house, we're going to egg it. it. That's Mr. Johnson, I, I know his kids. Uh, he, he wants to buy a boat someday. He, uh, he doesn't like his job right now. He's uh, sprained his ankle when he was younger, and now he kind of walks with a little bit of a limp. Whenever you see someone as completely three-dimensionally human, you think you can put yourself in their shoes, you can only do that with a certain number of people. That's why it's so annoying with all this modern globalist, you know, I love everybody, we're one world, one love, one life. You cannot feel that way about seven billion people. You can abstractly feel that way. You can, oh, I really, I just hope that, you know, the, the wars in wherever, Rwanda, Congo, I hope that they do well. You don't really feel that way, the way you would if tomorrow you woke up and your neighbors had been drone striked. It's not the same. And that's where I'm going with this, is if you look at modern America, mo well, modern the West, actually, uh, people are incredibly nervous and lonely and depressed for the most part. And I'm not saying that this isn't uh, me trying to psychoanalyze individuals. I'm just talking about the numbers game. There, there's an absolute, people are constantly talking about this. There's an outbreak of anxiety. You see this especially with, uh, your, you, you can go in just about any workplace and people have all these comfort dogs, companions, uh, what, what's it called? Um, People have PTSD from non-traumatic experiences, at least they claim to. People have uh, emotional support animals. That's what I was trying to think of. It's staggering. It's not something you would have ever seen during any other period of history. But the reason why is because they don't have a community to rely on. People are utterly isolated. If you talk to, especially in the really urban areas, if you talk to these people, it's like, so, you know, where are your parents? Oh, they're back in Iowa. They're they're 700 miles away. Oh, well, where's your best friend? Ah, oh, I haven't talked to him since college. He's uh, Eastern Seaboard. Like they're just people separate. They splinter off and fragment in a way that you would never see for most of human history. If you look at the timeline of human history, for a good hundred thousand years at least, modern. I'm talking about modern, modern humans were just hunter-gatherers and they lived in tight-knit communities numbering smaller than 150 see where I'm going with that and then if you look at the past 6,000 years they lived in agrarian communities actually it's probably more like 10,000 14,000 years they lived in agrarian units small 100 150 really all this modern urban living amongst millions of people whom you don't know, which I think directly inspires the whole zombie genre and why zombies are popular, because uh, that's how it feels when you're outnumbered by people that you don't empathize directly with. This is incredibly new, incredibly unnatural, and I'm not trying to use the naturalist fallacy or anything, but it's very new. It's very different from how humans evolved. And that's why you see things splinter in these groups. That's why you see, you know, people divide into gangs and neighborhoods and things like that. But it's still not as close-knit as it would be in a more rural setting. It's very unusual to see people living this way, and I think that's why people are so agitated. They know something's wrong, they just don't know what. And this is my theory as to what. It's, uh, it's a combination of urban settings and living in these massive groups where you don't empathize directly with anyone. You don't see anyone as fully human, and no one sees you as fully human. Um, yeah, that's, that's the biggest issue that I see facing modernity. And, and the counter-argument would be, well, people have always lived in large clusters. Yeah, but those clusters were divided into different family units, different clans, different uh, tribes, etc. 
uh, even even the massive Roman Empire and, and other similar establishments, people were divided. Um, and, and you see it, like I said, with the way the military is organized. The reason why a company has a hundred people is because a hundred people can empathize with each other. They're sleeping in the same ditch. They care about each other. If you didn't divide things, can you imagine if a military had no divisions? If if a squad and a like for example uh, a division, which is like a thousand people, if, if there was no distinction between the two, uh, you you can go ahead and ask somebody who was in the military. It's like what company were you in? They'll tell you immediately because it means something to them. It, the same thing with schools. The, you know you can go to some little Pissant County in the middle of nowhere where there's two schools in a district and they'll be competitive with one another and then you go into individual schools in the different classes view each other differently there's cohesion within a class less so outside of it. It, it, it the way we function we are not ants we're supposed to be in small close tight-knit groups and you can even tie it in with feudalism it, during the feudal era the pre-industrial revolution era. People love to paint that with modern media as this awful time where you were just doomed. But truthfully, if you lived in the feudal era, you worked like 40, no, like 30, 20 to 30 hours a week. You had all these feast days. You knew your Lord uh, personally. Like He would go to church with you and, and he relied on you for his food. It wasn't this tyrannical establishment like they like to paint it. Now look at modernity. You work harder. Half of you probably don't even know your boss. Like the guy who's really at the top. I'm not talking about the, the local district manager or what have you. And even him, you don't really... Do you know that person as a person? If you saw them out at a restaurant, would it feel surreal or not? People are very disconnected is what I'm saying. And I think that going back to these tight-knit groups as well as uh, I, encouraging, I know it's not possible for most people, but encouraging people to live a more agrarian lifestyle, that is the cure for what ails you. That is the cure for this societal malaise that I see. And I'm not trying to sound like taxi driver or anything, <laughs> but I'll, I'll flesh it out more. I, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching the limit here. I don't want this to go over 18 minutes. Next week, I'll talk more about how this ties in with agrarianism itself. Uh, thanks for watching. Bye.